vehicles, people couldn't get into to dealership uh, showrooms and so on. And uh, a pretty good bounce back. And in fact, motor vehicle sales are now 14% higher than they were in, uh, uh, in February. And again, this is through August. And we just had September numbers that came out last week, showed an even an further gain. Household furnishing. So, so some of this is because consumers can't spend money on, on durables. You can't go on vacation. You can't you know, go out to restaurants and bars or whatever. You're going to find something else to spend your money on. So for a lot of people, it might be a new car. Uh, you, you had those checks that went out. So maybe that's a new uh, you know, down payment for a boat or, or, or a jet ski. So those things are actually doing, doing pretty well in this environment. Uh, Grocery stores, uh, you know, was were the big winner during the downturn uh, because people, were, you know, couldn't go out to restaurants, so they were uh, going to the grocery store and making their own food. You're still seeing improvement. A lot of this may be restaurants that are that are, you know, uh, doing takeout and so on. So that's one area where we have seen some some growth in the retail environment. Department stores, clothing, uh, and in uh, have, have been. Uh, pretty weak and still down, although there's been uh, some uh, some uh, improvement. But now people are shopping sort of differently than they have in their the, the past. If you go to the mall, you're on a mission, you're going to get, you know, t-shirts or under or socks, whatever you need, and then leave. You're not going to hang around and, and, and find things that you, you, you didn't know that you wanted and, and buy that. Gasoline, we've had a huge correction in energy prices. We actually had energy uh, oil prices go negative for a while largely because of the futures markets, you know, people were taking delivery when there was just a glut of oil. And uh, you've had some bounce back, but, but still down and oil prices are, are still very low at this point. Uh, but the big, big hit to consumer spending uh, came in consumer services. Healthcare, you know, if you go in for a routine visit, it was very difficult in February to April. It's still, you know, there's a whole new protocol. So you're seeing maybe less uh, of that, you know, doing a lot of online stuff and so on. So the healthcare spending is actually lower in the, in the pandemic. Uh, transportation services, so air, airlines and things like that, public transportation, those things are all still down. Recreation services, uh, you know, entertainment and so on, that's uh, still, still taking a pr pretty big hit. There's been a little bit of a bounce back. And in restaurants are uh, one where you've had some improvement, but still down. Uh, so, it, you know, that's the story, You're actually seeing unusual strength, probably unexpected strength in, in consumer durables at this point, but ongoing weakness in, uh, in consumer services. And again, these things aren't going to get back to normal until the, the pandemic is well behind us. You could get a vaccine. Uh, it's very unlikely that the vaccine would be 100% effective. A third of the population may not want to take the vaccine. Uh, even if it were effective and everybody took it, you'd still probably have a lot of people that may be reluctant to go out and, and uh, amongst crowds as, as they did in the past. So we think this is going to be a long, long road for recovery for, for a lot of these services. So what does the Federal Reserve do faced with this crisis? Well, back in early March, they lowered short-term interest rates uh, in two intermeeting moves down to effectively zero. It's an overnight lending rate of between zero and a quarter percent. It's typically trending around uh, 0.1% right now. And the Fed telling us they're going to keep rates here until the economy really shows signs that it's, you know, put put this stuff behind us and is back on track. And that's still going to be a long way away. Now, during the financial crisis, the Fed had a, a bunch of these special lending facilities, uh, credit facilities, and they, they uh, relaunched a lot of those and created some new ones. Some have been more successful than others in terms of like the Main Street the lending facility has been very difficult to get that off the ground. But uh, it really addressed a lot of these credit uh, liquidity issues that were uh, apparent early on. Even in the treasury market, which is the most liquid financial market in the world, we started seeing you know, some, some real issues with liquidity in early uh, March. And so the Fed came in really quick and, and helped ease a lot of those pressures. Now, the Fed has lending powers, it doesn't have spending powers, and that's why you're hearing a lot of this talk now about fiscal policy, which we'll get to in a second. The Fed also uh, relaunched the large-scale asset purchases, what's normally called quantitative easing, so they're increasing the size of their balance sheet. Uh, that rose to $7.2 trillion, and it's come down a little bit, but uh, still uh, you know, pretty high compared to what it was before uh, the pandemic, and the Fed signaling that they're committed to do, be doing a lot more here. 
Uh, here's uh, interest rates, the federal funds target. You see the Fed had been raising rates in 2008, changed direction 2019, lowered rates three times. And then here's the big drop that we had in, in, uh, in early March and the Fed signaling that they're gonna keep rates low. Now, the, the blue line here is the, the two-year treasury. You can think of that as sort of an expectation of where the federal funds rate is gonna go. Uh, and obviously it's saying that, you know, the market's telling you that doesn't they really expect the Fed to move uh, off the low end of, of rates here for, for quite some time. 10-year treasury has come down extremely low by, by historical standards. So if you're expecting to earn a lot on your checking account or savings account, you know, hate to tell you, you're not going to be making much money on those accounts for, for quite some time. Uh, the Fed meets to set policy eight times a year at every other meeting, the officials, so that's, you know, the five governors in Washington, and then there's 12 district bank presidents around the country. They, they get together and, and they all put together forecasts of growth, unemployment, inflation, but they also forecast what they expect the appropriate federal funds rate, the overnight lending rate will be at the end of the next few years. So each of these dots represents a forecast of an individual Fed official. Nobody's expecting any change in rates this year, next year. One guy assumes that rates will go up in 22, but most are still seeing it low and then on and, and through 2023 as well. So you're looking at, at probably four years here where the Fed doesn't do anything. And this has been the pattern we've seen in uh, the previous uh, monetary cycles where the Fed keeps rates extremely low for a very long time. Ultimately, when the economy is recovered, the Fed sees the uh, overnight lending rate moving back up towards two and a half percent. But again, that seems to be a, a long way away. Now, in late uh, August, the Fed revamped what's called the uh, long-term goals and, and strategies. Uh, and normally that, that comes out each January, the Fed puts together a statement the Fed's really been reviewing that in a lot of detail, a lot more last year. Uh, they were gonna make some announcements earlier this year, but because of the pandemic that had been delayed. So finally we got to August and the Fed's making uh, you know, two changes here. And uh, the Fed has two goals by law, as price stability and maximum uh, sustainable employment. And by price stability, they take that as meaning 2% inflation as measured by the PC price index. And what the Fed says now is that if you've got a period where inflation is below 2%, they will allow it to go above 2% for a while. This isn't a mechanical rule. There's no hard and fast formula how long uh, or how high it'll go above 2% or how long it'll go above 2%. But the idea is that over time, it's going to average 2%. And one of the problems we've had was that a lot of the, the markets uh, participants really started seeing the 2% as a ceiling rather than as a, as a target. And because it's a ceiling, then it means that inflation is actually going to average below 2%. So you want to get it as close to 2% as possible. Uh, in terms of the maximum employment, you know, we always had this view that the Fed should act preemptively to fight inflation before inflation actually shows up. That's now out the window. Uh, the Fed used to view the unemployment rate as, as signaling that when, you know, when it fell too low, that we'd have higher inflation in the economy. Uh, and so you need to act be before uh, you know, inflation gets out of hand. That's all gone out the window as well. So the Fed's looking at sort of a broad range of, of uh, the shortfalls in the employment. They're also looking at a really more broad-based and inclusive goal. And one of the things that the Fed learned when they did all these town halls and everything around the country, they talked to community leaders and they found that for low and mid-income communities, they benefited substantially from very low unemployment. That is the benefits in the recovery really started finally showing up in, in, uh, in these communities just within the last few years. So the Fed's really considering that uh, and keeping an eye on, on, you know, like the black unemployment rate, the Latino unemployment rate, those kind of things. So all else equal, you know, the Fed's gonna keep rates lower for longer. They're gonna tolerate maybe a little bit higher inflation than they had in the past. They're going to tolerate a lower unemployment rate they have in the past. None of that matters too much right now. But more importantly, this has been sort of the direction that the Fed's been moving the last couple of years. So it, it's not that big a deal, but it also is in that the Fed's really written this down. It's more like just banging the gong on this is how they're going to operate uh, going forward. Fed's balance sheet, as I mentioned, uh, you know, here's the financial crisis that in QE1, QE2, QE3, and then they started unwinding the balance sheet and then sort of shifted directions. 
last year. And, you know, this was the addition. A lot of people look at this and say, oh, it's going to lead to a debasement of the dollar, higher inflation. No, we, we had these same arguments back uh, during the financial crisis. Uh, but it does mean that the, the Federal Reserve is taking a lot of the treasuries, and particularly the uh, treasuries uh, that are being issued, uh, you know, with this, this stimulus that we've had in, in the spring, uh, they're taking that really out of the market. Inflation, we don't really expect to be too much of a problem. Uh, you are seeing a little bit of an increase right now, and it's largely because a lot of the prices that were depressed during the pandemic have rebounded. You're also seeing a little bit of pipeline pressures, uh, supply chain issues, as the uh, demand is, is, is str pretty strong. You saw the spending on durable, so there's uh, you know, some catch up there. And manufacturers are getting used to operating, you know, with the, the under the pandemic in terms of the hygiene and, and distancing and all that. Uh, but it's still a transitional period. It's going to take some time before those supply chains are really uh, flowing as freely as they, they had in the past. But in terms of inflation, you know, the widest channel for inflation pressures within the system is, is in the labor market. And uh, yeah, you have some states increasing minimum wages, that's a little bit of pressure, but in general, because of the weakness and, and the, uh, uh, the weakness in the job market, you're gonna see uh, very limited upward pressure, we think, on, on wages in the near term. So uh, inflation has been moving a bit higher. We don't really expect it to exceed 2% by much anytime soon. Uh, so that's monetary policy. What about fiscal policy? Fiscal policy, we're referring to taxation. Uh, so tax cuts or, or uh, increased government spending to get the economy moving again. So the support that we've had has been nearly $3 trillion, 14% of GDP. That is enormous. Uh, during the financial crisis, uh, fiscal 2009, uh, we had a budget deficit of $1.4 trillion. And at the time, that was 10% of GDP. So this is uh, much more substantial. And the initial stimulus, we had public health expenditures, no surprise there. You got the pandemic that you're dealing with, small business loans, the uh, paycheck protection program, things like that. But the idea that you're gonna uh, turn these loans into grants if, if employees are kept. Uh, the recovery rebate checks that I mentioned, in most cases, these are just direct bank deposits. Uh, this is an issue where economists by and large also don't send checks out during a recession. It's very inefficient. People are much more likely to, to save the money instead of go out and spend it and boost the economy. And that was the case this time as well. The one survey I, I saw uh, just within the last week or so that showed something like, you know, 80% uh, of the, uh, uh, the checks were either used to increase savings or to pay down debt uh, very little of that actually went out to, to increase spending. But it's something that the politicians love and it's something that they, they do every time, even though every, almost every economist will recommend not to do it because it's really inefficient. Uh, we had extended and enhanced unemployment benefits, as I mentioned, and funding for state and local government. And right now you're seeing discussions for a phase four. Uh, you know, we are gonna need more support. You know, there, uh, you got an election that's coming up. Uh, and back and forth day to day, and that has some influence on the, on the stock market as we've seen. Uh, but the two key things are extending these unemployment insurance benefits. It's gonna be absolutely critical for those that have lost jobs. And then the funding for state and local government where the, the budget pressures are building pretty, pretty quickly. So the question is you always have uh, in these, uh, when you're applying fiscal policy, is it gonna be enough? And you wanna go big, you wanna go large. And they did that back in the spring, but that's kind of lapsed. And the other issue is how are you gonna unwind us? You gotta you know, take it away eventually. But the trick is you don't wanna be in too much of a hurry. If you take it away too soon, then that's gonna have a, a dampening effect on the economy. So that is a real concern right now uh, as we wait for this phase four. Well, what about the impact on the budget deficit? Well. Here you're looking at a budget deficit. We just finished the uh, uh, fiscal two, 2020 year where uh, the deficit's been on the order of over three trillion, uh, and that's about 17% of GDP. Uh, partly because the GDP numbers are, are, are down, uh, but in comparison, you, you need to look at the numbers. You really need to look at it as a percentage of GDP. So, you know, the Reagan years is around four and a half, five percent of GDP. Clinton years, you actually had it, ended up with a surplus at the end of that, uh, Bush years, and then you had the financial crisis and uh, you know debt that started to get, uh, the deficit started to come down and then it started to increase. Now, now you got the pandemic to deal with and it's still gonna level out. 
these are budget projections based on current law. So you're looking at around you know, four and a half, five percent of GDP, uh, which is still pretty large. And the big problem here is that we were on an unsustainable trajectory before the pandemic. Uh, the budget deficit was on the order of around a uh, trillion dollars per year, and it was rising faster than, uh, than GDP. And at some point, we're going to have to address that. Uh, and get the uh, deficit back on a, on a more even keel. But there's, again, there's no pressure to do that right away. In fact, you do, wouldn't want to address the budget deficit too soon because that would uh, weaken the, the recovery. And now in terms of the details on the spending, uh, the purple here, the top is the interest expense. You can't really do much about that. Uh, the yellow is what we call entitlement, or mandatory spending, and Social Security, Medicare. That's a, sort of a, a contract with the American people. People have paid money into these trust funds, and uh, they expect to be you know, you know, get their money back in some form. Uh, and you have defense spending, the blue. So what you're left with is non-defense discretionary spending at the federal level. And this is actually relatively small, so you can take that to zero. Uh, and you would still have a pretty sizable budget deficit. So something's got to give here in terms of either raising revenue or uh, having some sort of entitlement reform. Again, there's nothing you can do about interest payments. So uh, there are going to be some tough choices uh, in, in the years ahead. Now, the scary thing is you look at, at the, the federal debt and uh, people look at it as a percentage of GDP. Not that there's anything magical about uh, seeing a debt level of 100% of GDP. Uh, because one, the debt itself is sort of a stock. It's a level. Uh, the GDP is a flow. It's a uh, rate of activity per year. So back in World War II, you had a big increase. Uh, and then uh, we never really paid off the debt from World War II, but because the economy was growing, the debt fell as a percentage of GDP. You can see the Reagan years here, uh, you know, Clinton years, uh, and then uh, you had the Great Recession. So you had a big increase in, in the federal debt and then an increase due to the pandemic. Now, this is federal debt held by the public. And uh, that's uh, the overall federal debt is $27 trillion, trillion with a T. It's 21 uh, that's held by the public. The rest, the $6 trillion, is debt that the government owes itself. So it's a little bit confusing. What do we mean by that? Well, people have paid money into Social Security and Medicare. But the government's borrowed against that. So those trust funds, it's like $6 trillion. So I think the government really has to make good in it. And as the baby boom generation retires, you're going to get bigger strains on Social Security and Medicare because it's not just the demographic, it's the healthcare cost escalation. So a lot of that debt that the government owes itself ends up being federal debt by, held by the public as the government has to, to make good on, on these uh, uh, in, in entitlement programs. So. Uh, you know, this is where you're going to get a, a big, big surge. Now, you can imagine that if you're a, a global investor and you're looking at the U.S. and you're saying, well, geez, this the, looks really unsustainable and, and uh, I'm not going to invest in the U.S. because of it. Well, every other country in the world faces this same problem. You know, they have retirements for uh, their their citizens, their, their elderly, their health care and so on. Uh, China, for example, because of the one child policy, their labor force peaked in 2011. So even a country that's growing rapidly like China, are, you know, these, these uh, issues are coming pretty, pretty rapidly. Japan is about you know, maybe 20 years ahead of us. Europe is ahead of us in terms of a lot of these pressures. But, but you know, there's no country really that, that uh, is going to be able to, to sidestep these kind of issues. And again, these are going to be uh, uh, big, big problems that, that uh, governments are going to have to face around the world. And again, it's going to matter for, for tough choices. But the idea that you want to start addressing this and paying down debt, uh, this is not the time. Uh, it's like the St. Augustine quote, you know, uh, Lord grant me, uh, you know, chastity and purity, but not just yet. <laughs> so you want to keep the economy going. You don't want to uh, uh, start with austerity where it's going to weaken uh, the, the recovery. Now, I want to start and talk a little bit about uh, some of the pieces of the economy where we're seeing some strength and, and some, some worries. Motor vehicle sales, as I mentioned, you know, you know, a big drop off in the, in the, during the pandemic. Auto dealerships were pretty quick to figure it out in terms of uh, how to sell cars uh, and do, do, you know, with the masks and the social distancing and everything else. And you've had sort of steady improvement. And now you're looking at, at levels that are pretty strong. 
imports are uh, is not just the import make, but you know, like, like BMWs or Toyotas that are made here will count as domestically built cars. That, that uh, obviously is a, a big part of uh, U.S. production, and uh, that assembly of vehicles actually came to a halt in April. It's it's come back, so you have maybe a little bit of pent up demand here. People couldn't buy cars in, in February, March. Uh, in April, so they're buying buying cars now. People have been sort of stuck at home. Maybe you, you can't fly anywhere, so you're going to buy a new car and take a vacation. We saw, you know, some of that demand in in the uh, in the summer months, but it, you know, it does look like a pretty strong recovery. But bear in mind that the unit sales, most of that goes to the consumer, but a good portion of it still goes to uh, the these uh, fleet sales, what we call rental companies, and so on. Uh, and uh, the rental cars obviously aren't going to be in quite as much demand because of the, uh, the pandemic and, and the ongoing issues with, with travel there. In terms of manufacturing, the big story again with autos taking a big hit and then bouncing back, now actually a little bit stronger, a little bit of variation uh, month to month, excluding autos, you had a big hit. And come, so the manufacturing sector didn't take as big of a hit as say consumer spending did. But it's also you know rebounded, but it's also also a partial rebounding. Uh, oil energy is a, has been a big big story in the U.S. over uh, the, the last few decades. You had an oil price correction in, in uh, 2015, and then a bit of a recovery, and now you've had another huge leg down. And when you think of the energy industry, you can divide it up into extraction. That's the pulling the the uh, gas and oil out of the ground, and then there's also the ex exploration. So it's the drilling equipment and everything else. So there's a lot of capital that goes into energy exploration. So this means that business fixed investment is going to be really a lot weaker. Uh, and we saw that during the, you know, 2015-16 uh, as well. Uh, but uh, price of oil is likely to remain relatively low. It's a little bit over under 40 dollars a barrel. We don't expect that to be uh, increasing sharply anytime soon. Uh, and this idea of working from home, it's probably going to be more long lasting. So uh, people aren't going to be qu commuting quite as much as they did. Trade policy, uh, you know, we've had these Trump tariffs and like most economists, I'm not a big fan of the Trump tariffs. Uh, China doesn't pay the, the these tariffs, the US consumers do or businesses do. Uh, and for the steel industry, for example, you have a lot of, of uh, of firms that use steel and aluminum and they're paying higher tariffs. So it raises the cost for a lot of US manufacturers. Uh, and that's been a big, big issue. And in terms of the trade, in terms of the imports, you had some hoarding of raw materials in anticipation of the tariffs, maybe a little bit of a letdown. And then here you've got a big drop in imports and then a pretty sure bounce back. Uh, these are numbers through August. So uh, imports of, of raw materials, again, this is merchandise trade. So it's good, so it's raw materials, also finished goods, and we're not really seeing much inflation in, in imported finished goods. But exports, on the other hand, you had a big drop, a steeper drop than imports, uh, and then a smaller recovery than what we've seen in imports. So the trade deficit actually widened uh, during the, the worst part of the pandemic, and then it's actually widened in, 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 again in, in the initial recovery. So the trade deficit, the merchandise trade deficit, their difference between these two, the monthly figure is at a record for both July and August. Now, we also have a trade surplus in the US uh, and a lot of that is tourism and things like that. So with the pandemic, that surplus is a lot lower uh, than what we've been used to. But uh, this rebound in imports means that it's gonna actually subtract a little bit from GDP growth. So it's kind of interesting. You may see some shifting in terms of the supply chain where uh, firm, US firms are getting their supplies from around the country. There's maybe a little bit of shift away from, from China, but probably not a lot, not as much as, as, as you might think. Uh, a lot of that has gone to places like Vietnam, Thailand, Mexico, especially. Uh, one area of strength that we're also seeing is in the housing sector, where you've had a pretty good growth in, in both existing home sales and new home sales off the bottom. Uh, and again, it gets to the idea that if, if this working from home thing is going to be a lot more longer lasting, uh, you want not necessarily a bigger home. Uh, you probably want a more attractive location. And if you're used to working in the city, well, you can live farther away from the city and get a bigger home for the same amount of price. Uh, and I read one story today, one area we're seeing now is uh, 
an increase in demand for uh, you know Mary Poppins, the, the uh, having a a full time uh, governess or nanny, uh, because you know with the kids at home, you know, you've got still got to work, and, and it's been a huge strain, particularly for uh, the female population. Uh, so th th these, I think, are longer term trends, and we're probably going to see continued strength in housing going on for, for a while. Now, you have to be a little bit careful with the new home sales. These are, tend to be pretty quirky. So this was probably an exaggeration, but the strength I think is, is, is underlying, you know, uh, there, uh, that's pretty clear. Um, bear in mind that, you know, we think, usually normally think of, of the, the housing sector as being the canary in the coal mine. It's one of the areas that usually falls first during a recession and then recovers uh, later on. Uh, but in this case, this is an entirely different different kind of animal. Uh, in terms of cons well, the, what's driving demand as well is also low mortgage rates. The 30-year mortgage rate, uh, Freddie Mac commitment index is uh, under 3% has been for, for uh, you know, a number of weeks now. Uh, construction activity, housing starts and building, these are just for single families back above year ago levels. So uh, a very sharp rebound. And again, we think this is likely to, to, to improve. What does this mean for the overall economy? Well, home building is really only about three and a half percent of overall GDP. So this will add a little bit to, to GDP, but it's not a really gonna be a game changer given the, the weakness that we're seeing in, in consumer services. Oop. Now, uh, jobless claims, and I actually have updated these with the numbers today, uh, been uh, trending at a still pretty high level. They're not quite as horrific as they were. We've had issues with the change in the seasonal adjustment. So we went from a multiplicative seasonal adjustment to additive. That's still not a great way to uh, seasonally adjust the numbers, but it's less distorted than it was in the past. But you can see, you know, when we're losing, you know, having 6 million people filing claims for unemployment insurance benefits uh, back in, 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 in April, that was a huge strain. I was almost shocked that the the systems were able to handle it. Some states like Florida, you know, the, that wasn't the case. And a lot of these claims may be repeat filings that people, you know, got tired of waiting and then they filed again just to get, get their uh, unemployment benefits. But before the pandemic, we had been trending a little over 200,000 uh, jobless claims per, per week. And now we're, we're leveling out a little over 800,000. So it's, a, it's just that you know, we're still seeing a lot of weakness in, in the job market. So under the surface in, in terms of the employment, yeah, you lost a lot of jobs. You're getting a lot of those jobs back. You're also seeing maybe some of the jobs coming back or going away. And the broader economy, you know, we're still probably shedding jobs, not terribly, but pretty, pretty badly. Uh, and things like, you know, you hear announcements in terms of the airlines, uh, Disney laid off a, a bunch of people last week. So those kind of layoffs, I think, are going to continue for a while. And that may mean, again, more moderate improvement in, in the, uh, the payroll numbers going forward. Uh, so what this also means is you're still going to need a lot of support for those people that are unemployed. Uh, jobless, uh, uh, if you look at non-farm payrolls for the uh, uh, state and local government. The federal government is actually a, a, not that big of an employer. You got uh, under you know, 2.7 uh, million people working for the federal government. Uh, and that really hasn't changed much. I mean, the recent numbers, you can go back to, to like the late 1960s and this is not much different. Uh, the, where you've seen the growth obviously in state and local. And over time, a lot of the federal government it, uh, issues have been sort of pushed down to the state levels. So state and local governments have grown. And normally you're gonna see them providing some level of support that you're still gonna need policemen and firemen and teachers. Well, guess what? During that, that financial crisis and the aftermath of that, of that, the balanced budget requirements that these states have led to a lot of job losses. And it was only recently that we uh, recovered a lot of the jobs that were lost during uh, the, the financial crisis and, and recovery. So this I think is a big, big fear. In fact, if you look at the numbers, you're way, way down. Some of this is, is education jobs. You may not need, when you think of education, it's not just the teachers, but it's the people driving the buses and, and the lunch lady and you know, all the administrative staff and all that. So you're not seeing as many people being hired in, in for education this September compared to some of the past uh, uh, recessions. Uh, at the same time, you know, this is going to be, a, a, you know, a serious hit that, you know, this, these are a lot of jobs that are still lost, may not be coming back anytime soon. And we could see this situation worsen, 
worsen. So uh, again, with the fiscal stimulus that's being debated, uh, a lot of issues there. Uh, so the economic recovery, it's really gonna depend on the virus and efforts to contain it. Uh, the reopening should be gradual. We kind of expect that to be. Uh, there are risks of moving too fast. So you've seen an elevated level here and there. And the, uh, the spread of the cases has been really kind of mixed across the country. Uh, you know, obviously, initially, you saw the, uh, uh, you know, New York and, and that, that area getting hit pretty hard. And then now you're seeing you know, a lot of the rural areas getting hit harder. We don't really expect to see another full shutdown like we did in March and April. So we are getting used to living with the pandemic. There may be a little bit more restrictions over time. Uh, and bear in mind that it's not just the government restrictions that the, the, in February and uh, March and April uh, that, that uh, had an impact. We saw a lot of people uh, choosing to work from home before there were sort of state and county mandates. Uh, we do expect the economy to rebound. It's going to be gradual, long-term changes to consumer behavior, things like working from home. I think that's going to be more permanent change, some changes with, with global trade. Uh, the key concerns are providing support uh, for the, the people that are going to be unemployed for a long time. I think that's going to be critical. Uh, we need support for small businesses and the entrepreneurship. Uh, normally, those, those small businesses provide a lot of the growth in the economy in, in a recovery. Uh, that wasn't the case during the, the last uh, downturn. Uh, and again, the state, and I can't stress this enough, the state and local government budgets are going to be under severe strain. Uh, you're going to have issues like with, uh, you know, the property taxes where, you know, you've had pretty good growth in, in the housing market, which may help the, the, uh, the property taxes, but the sales tax are, are one area where it's going to be pretty restrained. And really with tourism, that's not the ideal tax because you're taxing people that don't live there. Uh, and those revenues are going to be pretty weak for, for quite a while. So a lot of challenges uh, for whoever wins the election. And I haven't really talked too much about that. But uh, my view is that, that uh, you know, a lot of this, uh, people ask, well, what, who, what does it mean for the economy if it's Trump? What if it means if it's Biden? Well, it's not just the person that's in the White House. But it's also the makeup of Congress. And uh, if you get one party rule where you've got both chambers of, of, of both the Senate and the House and the White House, then that party can actually do things. If it's a stalemate, then it's gonna be much tougher to get things done. Uh, but in general, you know, we see this time and time again where you have all these proposals and the president really can't enact all these things as, as they want. Uh, there are always difficulties in getting, getting things done. President always gets the credit or blame for what happens in the economy. But Congress really holds the purse strings in terms of taxes and spending and things like that. Uh, you may have issues with confidence and, and uh, with who's in the, in the White House. That could be an issue. But ultimately, the economy, I think, is going to do, do fine no matter who is president. I think we're going to still see the economy expanding. I think the big difference is that, that if, if it is Biden, you may see a lot of the Trump tax cuts go away, uh, higher capital gains tax rate higher tax rates on, on upper income. Uh, that obviously matters, I think, a lot more for, for maybe the markets, but uh, probably not that much for, for the economy. Uh, the other issue is if it is Biden, you're probably gonna see more fiscal spending. So maybe more, more debt, maybe a little bit higher bond yields, but probably not a lot. So uh, again, I think, uh, you know, there are gonna be challenges. There are gonna be things that come up that, that uh, you know, we can't even foresee, obviously with the pandemic, that was a big, big, uh, big surprise. Uh, but ultimately, you know, the, the U.S. economy will reinvent itself. That's been our great success. Uh, 200 years ago, people, uh, most people were in agriculture. Uh, after World War II, a third of, of the people were in, in manufacturing. So the economy will evolve over time. We're not sure exactly what, what people will do. Uh, but I, I think you, you can't really bet against the uh, U.S. economy over the longer term. So uh, at that point, I think we can uh, open up for questions if we still have time or do we use up all the time? No, we are available to uh, ask questions. You can either uh, unmute and come in or you can put it in the chat and we will make sure that those questions get to Dr. Brown. Um. Dr. Brown, thanks so much for your uh, knowledge and input. Um, 
what advice would you give uh, local municipalities as it relates to um, the budget concerns that you um, noted? Well, I, I think one of the issues is that uh, I think a lot of these pressures are gonna be with us for a long time. Uh, so you should have been planning things already in terms of you know, what can, where you can make cuts uh, what things are more critical than others to get, it, you know, it, it's not an easy choice. The things aren't, aren't going to be easy. Uh, and you have to decide, you know, what, what's, what's most important, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, having, uh, you know, wage cuts for, for employees, things like that. Uh, any way you can trim costs. Uh, I mean, those, those, those are really going to be the, uh, the lessons, but it's, it's still going to be a, a uh, a difficult road ahead, I think, for, for state and local governments. Uh, I'd watch what's going on in Washington. Uh, and in terms of, of getting uh, aid to the states, that seems to be a real sticking point between the, the Democrats and the Republicans. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, at this point, it looks like any sort of fis further fiscal support may end up coming after the election. And depending on who wins, it could end up being, you know, you have to might wait, wait until January or February. So uh, that's a real problem. I think, you know, personally, the local communities, typically you have to have a balanced budget so you can't go out and borrow money uh, to make things happen. Uh, so that that's obviously uh, is pretty difficult. And it's very similar to what I think we went through, you know, 10 years ago. Thank you. I wish I had a better news for you, <laughs> but I think, I think the strains are really gonna be there. This might be a quiet group this morning. Other questions, you can put them into the chat or you can unmute and come in and ask the question. Dr. Brown, from a uh, just a debt issuance or debt management <clears throat> standpoint with <clears throat> rates and uh, everything you discussed, uh, any any suggestions specific to that? In terms of what's going on with the federal government or? or well, just with anticipated rates and uh, um, the economy being, you know, with, with I think rates were going to be flat, that the open market committee suggested that for the next four or five years. Any, any I, just tidbits of information for, for us who are managing our, our debt for, for our entities and, and uh, well, short short term interest rates aren't aren't going anywhere for for you know uh, years now. I think we expect them to be, to be uh, extremely low. Uh, the ten year treasury it's around 0.7 percent or so the last week or so. So, you know maybe that increases a little bit. Um, you know a lot depends on what happens. I think if we get more fiscal stimulus, you may see the, you know some encouragement about the economy and and, and bond yields moving a little bit higher. But we're not going to get back to you know five six percent you know ten year treasury any anytime soon if if ever. Uh, one of the issues we had well before the pandemic was the, the this idea uh, of the the change in the, the population dynamics. The fact that you know we're looking at a different environment than we did you know 20, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, you know 30, 40 years ago you had baby boom generation coming into the workforce. Still, you had female labor force participation increasing. And those workers are also consumers, so the economy could grow a lot faster. The, the, the labor force, uh, you know, 40 years ago was growing, you know, two and a half to three percent per year. So if you had on, you know, productivity growth of one percent, you could grow the economy, you know, four percent GDP growth without really generating much inflation. Now you're looking at the labor force growing at a half a percent per year. We've cut immigration in half. Uh, which is kind of self-defeating because you have more immigrants, you get more people paying in to Social Security and Medicare, helping to lead a lot of those financial strains. So at a half a percent per year labor force growth, you get uh, the uh, productivity growing at one, and a, one to one and a half percent, and GDP growth is gonna really be more like one and a half to 2%. So that's a whole different environment and that implies much lower long-term interest rates than we've seen in the past. So we aren't going to get back to, to sky high uh, interest rates. I don't think we're going to get a, any major increase in, in inflation. People still worry about inflation, um, but I just don't see where it's going to come from at this point. 
Uh, and that means, you know, bond yields may creep up a little bit, but, you know, you're not going to see a huge increase. Uh, and it's really tough because as, as financial advisors, we, we always would tell people if you're getting close to your, your, your child's education that you've been saving for, your retirement that you've been saving for, you want to shift to safer assets, fixed income. But nobody's excited about buying a 10-year treasury at 0.7%. There, there are other opportunities. You should talk to your financial advisor about living with, with a fixed income because you can have dividend paying stocks and, and so on. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's a lot different environment than what we had in, in previous decades. One of the questions in the chat, Dr. Brown, is will the forthcoming recovery be longer than the recovery following the Great Recession? Uh, I think this is, uh, well, we, the initial recovery has been incredibly swift. You know, we had uh, Fed Chair Powell uh, giving a speech uh, earlier this week where he, he mentioned that, you know, and it was also included in the Fed minutes that we had yesterday, that the, the initial recovery has been a lot swifter than we thought it was going to be. We thought this, there would probably be more contagion to, to the broader economy, but parts of consumer spending have, have rebounded faster than, than we thought. But that while that initial recovery has been quicker, the long-term recovery may end up being a lot uh, more extended because again, it's, it's when are people going to be, you know, uh, happy to get back into crowds? Uh, you know, are you going to get in on an airplane? You're going to take a vacation. You're going to eat at a crowded restaurant or, or go to a bar. Are you going to go to a, a, a concert? And those things, and particularly, you know, a lot of that spending in here in Florida, we see, I go, Every concert I go to, it's like, where do all these old people come from? <laughs> it's, uh, these are the people that aren't really want to, going to want to go out. Uh, uh, you know, I had tickets for the symphony. And, you know, it's, uh, you know you're not, I'm not going to want to do that for, for quite a while. So even with a vaccine, you know, it's probably almost certainly not going to be 100% effective. Uh, you may want to wait and see what kind of side effects. Uh, you know, uh, surveys already show that a lot of people aren't going to want to take it. And... Uh, People my age may still be reluctant to go out in crowds for quite some time. So, you know, a lot of that consumer services will, you know, take a, a very, very long time to recover. Uh, so you're talking probably years to get to get back to where, where you were. Uh, but again, at the same time, you're also seeing, you know, firms sort of adapting. So the hotel industry, for example, is, you know, uh, having better hygiene and stuff, but it's still going to be a long road back to, to a full recovery, I think. Well, seeing that there's uh, no other questions, we did want to thank uh, Raymond James for sponsoring uh, this, the conference and this session. And thank you, Dr. Brown, for your presentation, packed full of information for sure. We appreciate that. My pleasure. Just to let everyone know, you will have access to his PDFs. There was a lot of graphs and a lot of information in there that might be helpful and you can digest later. So we will make those available. We hope that you will come back to the 1015 session uh, talking about leading in crisis and that we'll have another follow-up session tomorrow related to uh, climate um, and resilience. So thank you for joining us and we hope to see you all soon. Thank you, Dr. Brown. All right. Take care, everybody.